Julie Gastier Foster is the PI for the National Cancer Institute Center for Cancer Genomics Biospecimen Core Resource, which is headquartered at Children's Hospital, uh, where she's also a professor of pathology and uh, pediatrics at NCH and OSU. Uh, she earned her PhD uh, at the Harvard Medical School. And Laura Monovich is the operations director for the Total Cancer Care uh, Biorepository Program at the James Cancer Hospital, although she also worked at uh, Nationwide before that, as well as OSU before that. So she's moved back and forth between the two institutions. So uh, between the two of them, they know OSU and Nationwide very well, and so we're glad to have you both with us. Thank you. Laura and I are going to kind of tag team here. So we're going to try to talk a little bit about how you do access biorepositories both here at and at Children's. Um, I want to, I promise we don't have an hour's worth of slides. So I want to follow up to the discussion that was going on before. And I had to bite my tongue a couple times, Federica, to not say anything because I, I definitely have a couple comments on that discussion. And this comes from one, our experience in TCGA. So as Stuart mentioned, we've processed most of the specimens that went into TCGA and have learned a lot about the sites that contributed specimens to those. So I want to say a couple things about that. Um, I also am responsible for the leukemia banks at Children's for a couple of the cooperative groups. So um, I agree with some of the leukemia <laughs> comments that were made, but it's a little different on the solid side sometimes. So I want to make a couple comments there. And also just talk a little bit about what we've learned over the years. So we talk about the quality of bio repositories. And Nilsa mentioned this morning Steve Quammen, who started our banks over at Children's. And, and Steve was my mentor when I first came to Children's 15 years ago. And he always used the number about two thirds of the specimens in our bank were probably high quality, OK, as a ballpark number. Now, I think that over the years, it's gotten better. But I think that number also relates to our specimens come from more than 500 institutions around the country, around the world. So you add a bunch of factors in there from processing time, or, um, delays in transport, from you can't control 500 sites and how long they take to freeze things. So I would expect that in a on-site repository, that number should be higher. Okay, so two thirds is kind of what we estimate for when it's kind of a, I don't want to say a distributed bank, but a distributed source uh, for a biorepository. And I do think we've learned enough that it's gotten a little better, but still that's what happens. Um, and it's not completely on the bank. It's obviously a variety of things. I think we do a lot of educating of our sites that are contributing, trying to decrease time to freezing, some of these things that you can do, but you just can't control everything that happens. Um, the other thing, another example of what's going on, there were, this was also still while Steve was here, so this was in um, probably 2005, 2006. We had distributed some bloods to a researcher, and he called Steve up and he said, Steve, these are all junk. I can't get any good RNA out of them. Okay, sound familiar, right? Well, the truth of the matter was, he, so this was very Steve, some of you that know him, he called me, he said, Julie, figure out what's going on. Here's the story. So I started digging, and it turns out that that protocol was written to send DNA for children's oncology group specimens for a germline DNA, uh, I'm sorry, blood for a germline DNA specimen. Okay? They were never intended for RNA. They were never put in any preservative that you were going to get good RNA after you sent them all over the country for two days. And so it's just a matter of we didn't know at that time what we might use that blood for later. They wanted them for RNA now to look for tumor markers, but that's not what the intent was. So there's a lot of discussion today about if you try to set up a new protocol with a biorepository, really talking a lot between the bank and the investigator of what do you want and try to predict five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, what are you going to want? And that is so hard. And this is just a technology thing, right? Now they can get, uh, you know, a couple tumor cells out of a small amount of blood and, and follow that in blood, even though it's not a blood-borne tumor. They didn't think about that 10 years ago. And you have to think about what you're pulling out of a bank and what the original purpose was. Sometimes it can still be extended to what you want, and sometimes it can't. Um, and so I learned a lot through that process. We, we ended up doing a lot of studies. How do, you, how do you best get blood for multiple things from X to Y point in order to retain everything you want? And uh, so I think a lot of banks can talk to you about that. And I, I really want to emphasize that. And I was joking with Bill Smoyer um, just before this, because 
a lot of our jobs as by repository um, bank directors um, is answering some of those questions. So Bill has a proposal going in asking uh, most of my group to do some, some work for them. And I saw the proposal and I do a lot of this where I question what they want. Is this really what you want to do? Are you sure this is the best, best method for collection? Why did you pick this? Because this is the experience we have. And so I think that interaction is absolutely critical. Really laying out for us, for a biorepository, what you want to do downstream. Because sometimes there's a much better way to collect or you can get a, 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 a wider variety of things out of one specimen. I will tell you one more thing and then I promise we'll get to this talk. And that is uh, the TCJ experience. And I've learned a lot of things from TCJ. TCJ is the largest project ever funded by NIH. Um, they've, they're doing genomics on about 11,000 specimens now. They're doing every platform you can think of. And so these had to be very high quality specimens. And the beginning of TCJ, some of you know, was extremely rough. And the reason it was rough was they had promises from all these biorepositories of specimens that turned out to be junk. Okay, and so when they really got them in, they weren't passing any of the metrics. Um, they, they said they had 1,000 and really they had 50 that actually met whatever metrics were set up. So what you're saying is absolutely true. I think that we've learned a lot about the technologies related to biorepositories and things are improving. There are a lot more standards out there and you need to push a biorepository on what QC they're doing like was mentioned here. So the leukemias, of course, we do it going into the bank. The solids, a lot of times we go, do it going out of the bank and the reason is purely money. You can't afford, and I think it was mentioned in that discussion too, a lot of times you just can't afford to do what you really think is the right thing to do and you have to do it going out the door. So um, the other thing I'll tell you about TCGA is I never believed in co-isolation procedures and I bring this up just because it hasn't been mentioned today. I never believed it. You're gonna sacrifice your RNA or your DNA. We actually worked um, with another site to optimize a co-extraction procedure that's been used for all of those specimens. Um, it is column-based IRENA, by the way, uh, because they do use it for a lot of downstream sequencing. They really like it to be column-purified RNA, but it's total RNA, including the small RNAs. And it works extremely well, and it's a way that we optimize our biorepository specimens. So out of 30 MIGs, sometimes 10 or 20 MIGs, we get enough for all those downstream genomics that you want to do in TCGA. So, I do think there's optimization and letting the bank help you process whatever you want downstream. We get a lot of requests for 10 micrograms of DNA. When I know that our TCGA sites are using maybe a half a microgram to do whole exome sequencing, so you know 10 micrograms is way outlandish. We can optimize our bank by doing some of that processing and instead of just giving you the tissue, we optimize that with those co-extractions. So, I will get off my soapbox, but I do think that your question was really awesome because it's an issue that we've been dealing with for 10 years, and I hope that we're all learning a lot more about what we need to put into that QC, but some of it we just don't know what to expect in 10 years. So I think we're still probably getting something wrong, I'm sure. So, all right, so um, Laura and I were charged with trying to present a few things about what kind of considerations you have to think about when you're thinking about what kind of specimens do I want. And some of this has been mentioned, so I'll gloss over it. Um, what's out there? Um, and really, how are those requests handled? So they are different for every bank, and so we can't tell you for every bank, but the generalities are there, and some of them have been mentioned as well. So when you think about what you need for specimens and data, you have to think about the type of project. Is this, a, is this a clinical trial? So some of those specimens might have been used for additional testing for eligibility determination. So sometimes they have quite a bit of information uh, describing the actual specimen that might be available to you. They also might have treatment outcomes. So um, we're gonna talk a fair bit about the cooperative groups and a lot of them do have some of uh, these data associated with their specimens. That can be very, um, very important for you as an investigator if you want to upfront have the statisticians design with you and pick out X number of patients that had this and X number of patients that had this or X number that had this outcome or this outcome. Um, some of them are used for correlative biology within studies. So again, they may have that data available or they may not. Um, and then you have to, you've heard from the IRBs as well as a couple times now about whether you're gonna get samples that are identified, de-identified with a limited data, data set, et cetera, so we don't need to go through that. Um, 
Regulatory was also discussed by the ROB, so we just put it on here for completeness. But really thinking about what types of samples that you want to get. And this kind of gets at what I was just saying. If you're setting up a protocol, if you have unlimited money, which is not really true of any of us usually, but if you did, I'd try to get everything you can because the technology is changing so quickly that uh, you're, you'll probably regret something that you did five years from now. So the more you can get, the better and prepared in different ways. So there are, op, um, there are differences between frozen tissue versus FFPE in terms of some of the genomics platforms that we can do today. That's changing a little bit, so it may be a little different in a couple years, but just having that variety and getting as much as you think of, can think of right now is, is optimal. So we do get some fresh specimens. Um, those of you that actually uh, deal with fresh specimens know there's some real limitations of fresh specimens. We were joking about RNA. Um, you know, RNA quality is, is completely impacted by uh, that time to freezing. So fresh specimens we generally don't use for RNA, for example. But there are other things that you want to get out of fresh specimens, whether it's enzymes or um, pharmacology experiments. But that you can get fresh specimens. There are a few avenues that we want to talk about. Laura's going to get into the collaborative human tissue network, which used to be called the cooperative human tissue network. It's the same thing. Um, that's one way to prospectively get samples, and she's going to talk about that more. Um, you can establish a biorepository for a specialty area, and a couple of people in here have talked about this today. I mean, that's what happened with Leif. He came to us. He wanted um, an OPRN biorepository. We worked with him. This can occur. You can work with an existing bio, biorepository to uh, set it up for your area. And we just want to emphasize then, you get the advantage that the samples will be processed according to what you want, right? As long as you have those discussions with the biorepository, you're not going to have, uh, you have the advantage that you help design how they're processed. When you go back, you're kind of limited to whatever was designed for the setup of those specimens in that biorepository, and you just have to make sure that your protocol is going to, uh, your, your procedures are going to work with what's in the bank. Uh, frozen and FFP, we get a lot of tumors that are, are both of these. Um, the cooperative groups vary. Uh, the PEDS group tends to do more frozen, and the Yelps tend to do more FFPE. Not completely true, but overall, uh, that's probably the general trend. Laura's going to talk a little bit about the Comprehensive Cancer Center Total Cancer Care Protocol. Um, the Leukemia Bank here has already been mentioned for hematologic malignancies. And then there's a pathology tissue archive service that uh, Laura will also get into. Um, here are a few more, and this is not meant to be exhaustive, but we did want to kind of put it out there, and I think it's a great idea that was brought up to have an electronic resource where after the end of today that hopefully we can get a, a place where people put summaries up. I think it's a wonderful suggestion. Um, there are human genetics sample banks that are collected here at OSU. The Heart Center has a bank. Um, and you can see a, a couple others here in the, the veterinary um, biospecimen repository as we mentioned today as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Laura for a, a little bit to talk about the stuff at OSU, and then uh, I'll come back and talk about a few of the banks at, at Children's. All right. So lots of different mechanisms between here and uh, children. So we, we just wanted to highlight some of the larger mechanisms for obtaining biospecimens. And I'll start off with the Collaborative Human Tissue Network, or CHTN. Um, their goal is uh, prospective procurement. Um, there are six divisions, five adults, one pediatric. Um, they are not a bank. They do charge a nominal fee for their services. Um, two of the divisions are located here at, in, in Columbus. Uh, the Midwestern Division is located here at The Ohio State University, and it is directed by Dr. Leona Ayers. Um, they prospectively procure here at OSU, Case Western, and at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, the way the CHTN works, it's, it's divided up geographically throughout the United States. The divisions monitor different ge uh, geographical locations. Uh, the pediatric division actually is responsible for national and international uh, specimens. So the division coordinator or contact for Midwest is Randy Mant. So the pediatric division is located at Nationwide Children's Hospital. And Dr. Nilsa Ramirez, who spoke this morning, is the PI of the pediatric division. Their main source of specimens 
comes through an agreement or a collaboration with the children's cooperative group just in order to have enough pediatric specimens. Um, and again, their service areas, national and international. The contact for this division is Tommy Liz Kay. Um, so again, their fees are related to the services that they offer. You, you don't buy um, specimens. They can't sell tissue. Um, so, and they're not a bank, but they, they do do prospective procurement. Um, you can find out more about them at their website at www.chtn.nci. And, and this will be provided at the end as well, .nih.gov. It'll explain how you can go through this process. There's a fee schedule there as well. Please note that their fees will increase as of January 1st, 2015. So the cooperative groups, um, there are nine cooperative groups that actually were just consolidated this year uh, by NCI. And four of the nine are actually here in Columbus, Ohio. Um, we now have four adult groups and one childhood cancer group. Children's Hospital actually has the repository for uh, four of those groups, um, three of those groups, I'm sorry, and OSU has the Alliance or CALGB, and I'll, I'll get into a little bit more detail there. But along with this reorganization, there was a determination made that they need to be more transparent with their specimen availability. And so over the last year, year and a half, they've developed the navigator system. And the navigator system, the goal of this was to provide a comprehensive in inventory of all the specimens that could be available through the cooperative group setting. And the nice thing about that is that you can see how they're tied to the clinical trials and, and possibly clinical data that could be tied to those specimens as well. Um, it's a tracking system as well, so when an investigator applies for these, you can actually see where you are in the queue. Um, I can't remember, Julie, about the biostatistics portion of this. I think that you're still responsible for any biostatistic, biostat can't say the words now, that, that you need to have done. I don't think that that's built into this. No, so basically it's a way that you can search for what's out there across all the cooperative groups, and this is still in development. You can't see the, all the inventory of all the groups yet, but they're, this is what they're moving toward. So that then you can put in an application, it can go to multiple groups, and you can follow it through uh, the review process. But separate from that, you still have to work with the cooperative groups because they are going to have more clinical data than are available on that right. site. This, this link that's located here in this presentation is actually active, but and there is some inventory out there, but not everybody, in, everybody has uploaded their inventory. Again, the cooperative groups are still trying to consolidate as well, so they're still trying to get themselves organized, so there may be a little bit of delay on this. Um, so here at OSU, um, they offer tissue archive services. It's actually dates back to 1968. It's a complete uh, catalog of all the diagnostic material that the Department of Pathology has on hand. Um, so that's clinical remnant uh, paraffin material, so blocks and slides. Uh, they will not release the slides. They will possibly release the blocks with, with, with an application. So um, there are guidelines related to this as well. Your requests are made through the OSU E request system. And then the Total Cancer Care is a new initiative by the James that was just uh, activated in January of this year. And so what this is, it's a universal consent protocol for patients over the age of 18 that are seen at any James Care location. It's a lifetime consent. Um, what the, uh, the intent behind this is, is that we want to collect blood and solid tumor specimens from these patients um, and hopefully find matches to clinical trials as well as to do future research um, with the end goal of coming up with some targeted therapies. All the specimens that are procured here at OSU 
uh, are actually couriered to Nationwide Children's Hospital where they're processed further and banked at OSU or at Nationwide Children's Hospital uh, distribution location on Kinnear Road. Um, written into the, the Written into the IRB protocol is the ability to recontact patients, so we can actually contact patients and talk to them about uh, clinical trials that they may be eligible for, um, along with other information that we want to find out about these 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 patients. So we have a uh, specific honest broker protocol, which allows us to go to the I IW and pick up longitudinal data that we can identify these patients. Um, we, can, we can provide these specimens de-identified to investigators. Um, we're hoping that we will be able to have access to clinical and genomic data as well. Um, we, we are, we, someone had asked this earlier about does data come back, and that's what we're hoping with this protocol as specimens get used, especially in the genomic arena, that that data will be um, provided back and that we can have that data to be shared and used by other in investigators. Um, we have the ability to coordinate procurement, so if there are investigators that are interested in adding to the protocol, different specimen types, uh, we could do that as well. So I went through this quickly, but uh, here's, here's a little bit more detail. Um, blood is drawn at a clinically annotated blood draw. Uh, we are procuring blood for plasma, serum, and then DNA is being isolated um, at Children's Hospital. Uh, we're, re we're procuring snap frozen malignant tissue as well as normal tissue. Um, any additional non-invasive samples can be collected again at the investigator's uh, expense if they want to tack on to our, our protocol. The request forms for this project have not been put out on uh, the OneSource uh, website just yet, but if you need additional information, you can always contact myself or Heather Hampel, who's the PI of the protocol, or Nancy Single. Talked a little bit about this already, but um, the Comprehensive Cancer Center has uh, a shared resource that's the Leukemia Tissue Bank, and Dr. Lucas, who spoke earlier, is the director of that. And again, the source of specimens are the hematological malignancy uh, specimens, cryopreserved viable cells, um, match frozen plasma and serum and access to that can be found um, out on the Shared Resources site. The Alliance Leukemia and Solid Tumor Banks are both located here at OSU, formerly known as the CALGB. Um, specimens that can be found in those banks are paraffin embedded material, frozen tissue, peripheral blood, serum, urine, bone marrow aspirate. Um, access to these specimens can be found at htrn.osu.edu. And at this point, I'm going to hand this back over to Julie so she can give you more information about what Children's offers. So Nilsa had a slide earlier about some of the banks and the projects that we support down at Children's. Um, We've mentioned a couple of times the Children's Oncology Group, which is one of those five uh, cooperative groups that remains in, in the U.S. Uh, GOG is the Gynecologic Oncology Group, which is now part of NRG Oncology, so that's a, a merger. So we are now one of the, the three banks that supports NRG, as well as SWOG, which is another one of the adult groups that actually didn't undergo a merger. It was on its own before the mergers, and it has remained on its own. Uh, it's a very large... Uh, adult cooperative group that pretty much goes across almost any disease you can think of in adult cancer. So obviously GOG is limited to the gynecologic. Uh, the other parts of NRG are mostly um, breast and no, so what's the third? Colon. 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 So um, we support the, the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study, which may be of interest to some of you. Uh, this is a more than 30-year-old program where they have collected information on kids that had cancer and collected second malignancy samples, collected follow-up information on, on side effects, on um, other issues that those kids have had. 
Uh, CTAP is part of NCI, and we've supported some of their trials. We've mentioned uh, the CHTN. Uh, we support some of the Sarcoma Alliance through SARC, which is a, a primarily a, um, imaging. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. <laughs> These guys know better than me on, on SARC. Um, I mentioned TCGA, which is now spun off into a number of projects for us, including um, other genomics trials. Alchemist is a lung study that some of you know about. It's about 8,000 patients at NCI is sponsoring through ECOG as well as through uh, the Alliance, and all of those patients are going to get full genomics through the Center for Cancer Genomics, so it's an exploratory study. Exceptional responders, some of you have heard about this, just came out maybe of interest to some of you. It's a, a project where they're looking for cases where the patients responded in some exceptional way to a drug. So some kind of drug that maybe didn't make it through all the phases of clinical trials because it had such a low efficacy, but in a few patients it worked really well and they want to try to understand that at a genomic level. So a little bit of a, a fishing expedition in some ways, but it might yield some interesting results. So I think it's important to note that for these that, that we support at Children's, we don't control these specimens. I don't know if anybody said that today. We actually can't tell you, yeah, you can have some specimens from COG. These groups have their own governance. Um, we are controlled by the groups over us, and they are the ones that actually control access to their specimens. So we can help facilitate getting you in touch with the right people or the right application processes or these kind of things, but it's not up to Nilsa or myself uh, to give out specimens. Same with us. Same with OSU. Um, so I think some of this was discussed this morning. We do have some ancillary activities that go on within the Biopathology Center uh, that we can help um, provide some other services, including uh, we have a histology lab that's CLIA compliant uh, that supports some of our pathology review. Um, we, I think Nilsa mentioned the reference labs. We do some centralized testing within uh, the clinical labs for some of the risk patient, patient risk stratification. We have a nucleic acid core that goes with our biopathology center. We build tissue microarrays when requested by investigators. She mentioned virtual microscopy, which is a way uh, for scanning slides and distributing uh, outside of our institution which, without having to send around the actual slides. And uh, she mentioned kit management. And uh, we also do something that's different than the rest of the trials. We actually do data collection, clinical data collection for some of the large scale genomics projects. So um, we put this, this email in here. Um, you're also welcome to email Nilsa or myself anytime. And like she said, we can usually kind of point you in the right direction if we're not the ones that you need to talk to. Um, there are some common things. A lot of these have been mentioned. So again, that you may need to have an IRB approved protocol. There is that internal review process, and it really depends on what the bank is and who it's representing. So uh, Leif mentioned the, the small group that reviews OPRN requests. They're the same thing for the cooperative groups. They have a little bit different mechanism, uh, but every bank is a little different in that way. It's really important to know what level of data that you need and to have a funding source, as you've heard a few times today, um, this is not free. And I, I noticed we have on here pay for specimens. I, I, I'm actually one who uh, really frowns upon that wording, so I apologize. Um, as we've said a few times, we don't pay for specimens. We pay for our services to pull them out of the freezer, to QA them for you. Uh, that kind of thing is really what you're paying for when you're paying for biorepository services. Um, Knowing what kind of specimens were obtained under consent or not is important, and it's really important if you're trying to do something related to the FDA. They're going to dig into this even more. And then thinking about timing. This is not, you know, always a quick process. We've talked about multiple levels of approval that you need to get, and so you really need to think about that when you're putting in for a grant, and that's been mentioned a couple of times. It's on top of the IRB issues, there's, there's uh, levels of request and approval that have to be built into your plan as well. And then um, MTAs. There's, I think we got a handout today that has a little more on MTAs. Um, material transfer agreements are, are usually put in place. They're usually when you're going to transfer specimens between institutions. So it varies how the different banks use, use these. Sometimes the MTA is between the cooperative group and the uh, receiving investigator. Sometimes it's between us and someone else. It, it really varies, again, depending on the governance of the given samples, over the given samples. 
Uh, it basically defines the legal rights of each of the entities. And the way I think about it is, if we're sending specimens, you have certain rules as an investigator. You can't give them to somebody else because obviously they haven't been approved for another use beyond what you're doing. You can't uh, do anything to try to figure out who the patients are. You can't do anything to transfer the data in ways that weren't allowed. So if it's written in that you can only send, uh, you can't send genomic data anywhere, or however it's written, that's what this is about. It's really defining between um, the people that oversee the bank, and, and that can be different people, as we've mentioned, and the investigator to make sure everybody's on the same page about what you're allowed to do with those specimens. Uh, the tech commercialization offices at both OSU and Children's are the ones responsible for negotiating and review of those. Usually you have to have somebody sign at the institution, and then often the, the PI receiving the specimens has to sign as well. So we put a few additional resources on here, and I think we can add these um, to some. These are on the list, I believe, that went around, and, and hopefully they'll get included in that final, that final list from today. And here are a number of emails that you're welcome to contact for info on uh, children's are here. We're happy to take questions. Question, <clears throat> questions about accessing these resources, anything? Must be questions or comments. Are you all brimful right of knowledge here, right now? Up front here. So you very nicely laid out a lot of different resources that are there, but knowing, I guess, knowing what you want and knowing where to go get it is so some hard. of the issue in getting started. So. What is the order that, you know, someone has an idea, this is what I want to research. What is the order you suggest they do things? Do they start by talking to the repository and then get an IRB and then go back to the repository? What, what is the typical order of how you start from con an idea, conception of an idea, to actually using the bio repository? Yeah, I think, I think it's a really good question, and I'm not sure it's the same every time, but your specific question in my mind about whether you talk to the biorepository or you work on your IRB, I would definitely figure out what's out there first. Because the IRB is going to want to know, are they identified, are they, are they coded, all these kind of things that you don't know unless you figure out what's available. I think um, from, in my mind it really depends on what type of specimen you want. So are you really in the cancer world? in which case we probably gave you a lot of resources today to go after because that's really what a lot of us work on. Um, if you, other types of biorepositories we can help you find. We have links to some of those, but they're not as, in my opinion, I think NCI has put a lot of money into trying to make their resources more available to people, and I'm just not as familiar with some of the other larger scale efforts to try to make that transparency work. Um, I don't know, you guys have yeah, another? Yeah, Dave or Luke later. Yeah, that, great. Yeah, just to actually follow up what Julie said is that I think that I, I spent some time <clears throat> since I've sort of uh, tried to figure out how, the, how this all works. I spent some time to, trying to look at it from a user perspective, what is working, what's easiest. And we'd all like to have the website where you click and fill in terms, but, in, but everybody's requests and needs and, and everything, it's so different that you can do that, but it takes a lot of time. I would say pick up the phone or, or send me an email if it's, if it's the Leukemia yeah. Tissue Bank. Right. Um, it can save you so much time just to have a five minute phone conversation or a, even a 10, you know, a couple of emails back and forth will save you from an hour of filling in forms for things you might not need. Um, I have really struggled with how to make this streamlined and easy. And I keep coming back to the same thing. If I talk to the person first, it always just goes faster and yeah. smoother. So that's what I would suggest. I, I, I want to echo that. And I, I want to say you, you may or may not get out of these conversations. We are very much service organizations, right? You know, we're in it to try to make the research go farther. We're used to these emails all the time. So don't hesitate. It's, it's really Well, I think really not that was the intent with Navigator. So I was on the development committee of Navigator because when I was at Children's, we're such a service-oriented group, and that was it. That's how we managed our, how do you put everything in one application? You can't. 
And typically what we were finding is our investigators already had their IRB approval, they already had their funding, and they needed their specimens now because things were expiring. And we were just not in that, we weren't there yet. We, do, we just couldn't because we had so many other things in our queue. So we always encourage people to contact us, whether it's Julie, whether it's Nilsa or myself. I'm not there anymore, I'm here, but it's the same thing at OSU. Please, you know, put that, put that time, that five minute call in to find out, okay, what is it that you can provide to me? And I think it would help not only identify what you need to do next, in terms of IRB and funding, but also what, what we can provide to you. And I think it, it just saves everybody a lot of headache and heartache if you can do that. N Navigator was the same thing. It's like, how can we put this in so we're providing this concierge type service? It is very hard to put it all into a point and click type here and application process because you, you're, you're kind of losing the the face-to-face -face or the, the voice-to-voice. So communication's key, I think. And it may be you end up at the end of the day and you find out there's not a bank like that out there and you need to do something like CH10 where you put in an application and, I see, and say, I, I just need 20 normal thymus samples. Right. And they'll start collecting them for you. That's how, that's how they work. So right. it may be that there's just not a, a good source, but if you, if you ask around a bit, most of us are kind of used to linking people up. Right, and the CHT is the same way. I mean, with, with I can tell you that of the two divisions that are here, they're very available. You can pick up the phone and, you know, what can you, what can you collect for me, so. I, I just had questions specific, I think it's specific to the TCC. Um, when you guys changed from, or rebranded from BBR to TCC, uh, I understand it was more than just changing the name, there's a lot of new protocols and so on. I guess what I'd like to know is what's available? What's available? Not specifically, but do the rules that apply now for TCC, do they work retroactively for no. BBR? No. So for instance, if I'm interested in looking at follow-up mm -hmm. of a patient and for whom you have biospecimen available, does that exist in the BBR or did that only exist in the new TCC, which means I have to wait five years before something may actually happen in enough people, as I'm an epidemi epidemiologist. Right. Uh, and also, and I could be wrong here, but I was under the impression that with BBR, there was, uh, you know, you could maybe get the tissue, but if you wanted any clinical information, stage, age of the, part, uh, the, the, the patient, that that went through information warehouse, and actually pairing those data were very, very, very difficult. Correct. I, I understand that that may not be a problem now, so that's where. <laughs> but does it work retroactively? Right. So T that's where TCC came in to correct some of those things that we that they happened upon with the BBR. Idea, yeah. So what is happening now with the BBR is patients that have been enrolled on BBR are actually given the option to withdraw from BBR and enroll on TCC. So we have close to 700 BBR patients that have withdrawn from BBR and enrolled on the TCC. Oh, so, so BBR still good. exists as its own Absolutely, consent. it is not, BBR still exists, okay. but you cannot, there are no new patients are being enrolled Got to it. It. Um, it has not been closed, but the specimens and um, the patients that are in BBR are being withdrawn upon consent and re-enrolled on TCC. The problems that you just laid out with the BBRs is why we have the TCC is to... We, and, and I get that. So uh, if I want to study something prospective, okay, is that possible now or do I need to wait? Yes, you can do that now. And what you can do is you can contact Nancy or I. <laughs> and, and I think help. she's down the hall from me. So. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're <laughs> on the same floor with me. So, but yeah, we, we, can, we can look at that. Um, so we're, we're in the process of getting all the IW stuff. Um, so it's, we're, we've got a, a seamless, streamlined process with the data. So uh, we've got a informatics, we work with several different informatics uh, groups throughout OSU as well as an external vendor um, to try to tie all this together using registry data, IW, and uh, the EMR. So, so if they were part of BBR, is there still a difficulty in accessing yes. the clinical data? Yes. And for both of these groups, for currently, is there any 
and, and I heard, I know this is a promise for someday, so it's okay if no, but is there any epidemiologic data other than clinical? Is there, are there questionnaires that ever existed or are there questionnaires that will exist? I know we're gonna link up with Moffitt and do something. Right, the questionnaire, questionnaires don't exist. We're in the process of developing those questionnaires. Um, I thought that the goal was to try to get those in place by January, at least three of them. Um, I don't know where we are with that. I know with the Cancer Center grant um, between Dr. Pasquette and, and others that that's kind of taken the back burner, but I can, I can follow up with you and find out. But yeah, those questionnaires are, are, are soon to be released. Great, thank you. So you're welcome. I had a question. Um, we're trying with PRR, with the Perinatal Research Repository, to simplify the first form that investigators will have to fill in because we realize that many of the investigators soliciting specimens um, don't know if, even if whatever their idea or what they're looking for is even measurable. So, and that's kind of a breaking point. So we were thinking about um, having the ability to request for a limited number of specimens for pilot. A uh, very basic pilot. So I was wondering if you have experience with something like that. Doesn't really require a lot of scientific background. That would be unnecessary. If that molecule is not even. So some there. of the cooperative groups have a mechanism like this, where if somebody wants to do a pilot study on ten or twenty leukemia samples. Okay, the the person that over. I'm, I'm going to use COG as an example. So the person over the the bank proposal committee, so the person, this group of people that reviews proposals, sometimes the chair of that committee can deal with those small requests, those pilot requests, and has the authority, if it's under a certain number of specimens, to just allow it. And so I think you could set up a mechanism like that, you know, where you have a minimal amount of information and you give within your group, a, you know, that authority to somebody. Again, that's the importance of that governance that Nilsa talked about this morning, really setting that up and having people agree <laughs> on what those rules are. The cooperative groups are a little bit more difficult because they have to live by NCI rules, obviously, also. But they do have that mechanism. Other questions? Yeah, um, Laura reminded me of something. I think that anyone that is involved in a biorepository needs to be, if, if you are going to release your specimens to an investigator, you need to let them know what your turnaround time is. People need their specimens yesterday. So if, you, if it's gonna take six months for something to be approved, be honest and tell them that. The problem we see more often in the setting of the cancer cooperative groups is that when the time people get their stuff approved, the money was approved two years ago, so they're running out of time. They really have to spend the money, the resources, and the stuff is not approved on a time frame that is convenient for them to do all their studies and, and get all this stuff out. So I think it's very important that you're very honest for that, that governance that is going to eventually release the specimens, to be honest and say, this is gonna take a week, this is gonna take six months, this is gonna take five months, because that allows the investigator to plan. And, and it's just really sad to have to run into things and people actually run out of money before they get the specimens because the grant closed and they just don't have access to those funds anymore. So just keep that in mind. Well, thank you very much, Julie and Laura.